will be entitled the kingdom within the inner transformation of the heart and we are still camped out at the foot of the mountain with Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes and we're going to stand now in honor of the Word of God we're going to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and we'll be reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 5 beginning at the 17th verse let's be standing in honor of the Word of God every Word of God is precious turning now to the 2 Corinthians Epistle chapter 5, beginning in verse 17. Let us fill the house of God with the word of God. Together. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and have given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God, for you have made him be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made righteousness of God in him. God our Father, we thank you for this lovely, beautiful uh, January day here in 2018. Thank you for each and every life that is represented here today. Father in heaven, we know that you have called your children out of the darkness of this world into the marvelous light of your son Jesus Christ in uh, preparation for his wonderful kingdom. Thank you this morning for sending your Holy Spirit to convict our hearts, to open our hearts, uh, to, pre to prepare us, Father in heaven, for that glorious kingdom that you will one day ordain to fill this earth Living God, make our hearts warm to Thee and tender-hearted. We pray in the blessed name of Christ, our Savior. Be with this congregation and throughout the land, up and down the hinterlands of America, where men and women, boys and girls, are gathered in the name of our Savior Jesus Christ and opening their Bibles. God in heaven, touch their hearts, bless their minds, and guide us here in these perilous days. And we make this petition in the wonderful name of Christ our Savior. Amen. Uh, before you sit down, I'd like to call your attention uh, to verse number 18, which calls us to the idea that we have a ministry of reconciliation. Ministry of reconciliation. That, that's for every one of you and myself. We are all ministers of reconciliation. Let's say that together. Ministers of, of reconciliation. reconciliation. And then calling your name, uh, attention to the uh, verse in uh, verse number 20, where it says, We are ambassadors for Christ. You all know what an ambassador is. Well, today the beatitude that we're going to look at is calling us to be a minister of reconciliation, an ambassador of Christ. In this present world, you may be seated. As we turn our attention now to the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes, this has been rather a long, protracted journey, and uh, I would like to make a confession of everyone that's here. The Beatitudes are teaching me a lot about myself and about the, the entire superstructure of God's Word. The Beatitudes are Bible 101. Uh, they are the most fundamental milk of the gospel. Now, we know that the Bible is divided between the milk and the meat. Part of the Bible is steak. When you, when you tie into part of the Bible, it's like sitting down to a super thick uh, steak. And it's going to take some time to work your way through that steak. 
But part of the, the Bible is the milk of the gospel. It's you just drink it right down real quickly. We're in the milk of the gospel. But how many of you know that you will never handle the steak, the meat part of the Bible, until you first drink the milk? Just right. like a child, you grow up in the milk and you progress to the, to the meat. So this morning we're in the milk of the gospel. And uh, I know for some this is kind of treading on ground that you may have uh, been uh, through before. And for others, it may be new, but we're at the uh, we're at the seventh beatitude today, and that beatitude is found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number five and verse nine. Now, almost two millenniums ago—that's two thousand years ago—Jesus Christ, the Son of God, walked this earth in His mission to reconcile the sin-laden, elect children of God to their heavenly Father. That's why Jesus came. He came with a ministry of reconciliation to reconcile us who were lost in sin to God who was perfect and altogether righteous. And the purpose and mission of Jesus Christ when he came into the earth was to reconcile us, his children, to God so that we would be made uh, worthy citizens of his kingdom. Now, there was a day when Jesus walked the earth, and one day he was uh, talking to the Pharisees, actually, and they asked him a question. They said, uh, Master, when is your kingdom going to come? And Jesus answered them, and he said uh, to the Pharisees, the kingdom of God will not come with observation. Neither will they say, look here or look there. The kingdom of God is within you. This is found in Luke 17, 20 and 21. Now the Pharisees were really puzzled. How could the kingdom of God be within a person? Now that's a good question because every one of us must first have the kingdom of within us before we're going to be able to fathom and to adjust and adapt to the real outward visible kingdom that will one day fill this earth. So this is a very important lesson as we look at the kingdom within and uh, make our way through uh, this beatitude. Now, this up to this point, we have been studying all the Beatitudes, and each one builds on the other. If you have missed any one of the lessons that we've been dealing with, it's like skipping a stair, uh, going up the staircase, or missing one rung in the ladder. You miss that one and climb up without touching that one. So you miss something. Every This is a progression. Every Beatitude builds on the next. And today we are getting close to being at the very stomach of the staircase on the Beatitudes. And as we move into this uh, one today, the seventh Beatitude reads this way. This, uh, thus way it says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Peacemakers. Now this is a word we're all familiar with. Nothing new about the word. So let's... Let's jump into this uh, beatitude and see what we can figure out would be good for us to know about beatitude number seven. We'll begin by saying, folks, we're, broke, we're, we're born into a very broken world. A broken world. Conflict is all around us. Right now, you know people that are in conflict. You know married couples that may be in trouble. You know uh, families that may have uh, troubles. You may know children that are in conflict with their parents. You may know conflict in the workplace, people that are not getting along. You, know, you may know people that are in conflict uh, at any given station in life. In fact, conflict is everywhere. There are, there are shooting at each other uh, in several different places in the earth right as we gather this morning. The world is filled with conflict and turmoil. And so we know then that it's important. This is why Jesus said, 
that we're called to be a minister of reconciliation, a peacemaker, to bring uh, peace where there's conflict in every way that we can. Now, conflict goes on everywhere, church. It's in, it's in families. There are conflicts in churches. You hear of churches splitting apart. You hear of there's going to be conflict. Our world is pulsating. It's like a, a man with a giant toothache. And, and the world is pulsating with conflict and with dissension of every kind. It's filled with unrest. Now, Jesus made an, an interesting comment in Matthew 10 and, and verse 34 when he said, Think not that I have come to send peace, but I am I'm not come to send peace, but I've come to bring a soul. Jesus tells us that there will be conflict in the world. In fact, he says there will be wars and rumors of wars. There's going to be uh, international conflicts. There will be nation against nation, kingdom against a kingdom. So the world is going to be filled with conflict. And we know that Satan and all of his minions, their primary goal in this world is to bring conflict. The number one goal of Satan is to bring conflict into your life. If your own sin nature can't promote it, then he's there to knock at your door and see if he can create some conflict so that your house, your life, will be one of turmoil and conflict. And your goal is to be a minister of reconciliation. And in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you bring peace where there's conflict. You bring peace because you're, going, you're called to be a peace. Maker. So, with that introduction, uh, Jesus, remember then, has called us in all of our relationships, as children in a home, as husbands and wives, as church people, people who are working together in a work-related environment. Everybody has a mission of being a peacemaker. That's what the seventh Beatitude calls us to be blessed, happy. Happy are the peacemakers. The word blessed could equally have been translated out of the Greek as happy. Happy are those who are peacemakers. And so what we can say then on the seventh Beatitude is happy are those who live to resolve conflicts between people. You're going to be the recipient of wonderful grace and blessing if you learn how to be a peacemaker and bring people together in Christ. Now, none of us are born with the knowledge of how to be a peacemaker. When a child is born into the world, God did not equip that little baby with the knowledge of how to be a peacemaker. You didn't learn. I bet you, I, I would bet, uh, anything today that if anybody that's got a, degree, a college degree in here, you did not take a course in conflict resolution because they don't talk to it. There's, no, there's nothing offered in an ordinary college degree on conflict resolution. It's not in any high school curriculum that I've ever examined. And yet conflict resolution is a primary, urgent, compelling need in everyone in every life that will be Christian, you need to be a, a person who knows how to be a peacemaker. Now, God did not intend there's going to be peace, there's going to be a conflict in the world, there's going to be strife, wars and rumors of wars in the world, and there's going to be conflict in the world about you, church, but God did not intend for you, as a believer in Christ, to be in a marriage condition of conflict. He didn't intend for your family to be in conflict. He does not intend for a church, a body of church-going people to be in conflict with each other. So there are certain areas that God has built a perimeter around where he wants peace and tranquility. The truth is this, people. Every one of you need a refuge from the conflict that's in the world. You need it in your marriage, you need it in your family, you need it in your church. 
a safe place where you know that you have people that love you and you love them and there's harmony and goodwill. You don't want to be living in unhappiness and misery because you're in conflict with the wrong people. Now, there are certain people that you will be at enmity with as long as you live on this earth. There are people that would like to undermine this country and take it away from you. There are people devoted and dedicated to the, to the destruction of Christianity. You're not called to be at peace with them. God never calls us to negotiate with Satan. He never tells us to negotiate with sin and compromise with evil. We're not talking about that. We're talking about a ministry of reconciliation within families, within the body of Christ, his church, and that sort of thing. So having established that, we need to say, uh, church, that anyone who fails to learn how to be a skillful peacemaker will suffer for the lack of that skill all the days of your life. Now, we need to understand some basic ground rules for being a peacemaker. Ground rule number one. Ground rule number one, a peacemaker does not avoid conflict and simply withdraw from further contact with the parties in a dispute. You don't run away from conflict. Now, being a peacemaker does not mean that you simply swallow everything that comes your way so you can be at peace. It does not mean that you do not want to rock the boat and you just grin and bear whatever goes on around you because you don't want to disturb anybody. That isn't what a peacemaker does. That's not the way to deal with conflict in your life or in your marriage, in your church, or any place else, even the workplace. Secondly, you do not resolve conflict or you do not become an effective peacemaker by seeking to appease others and simply giving in and letting yourself become their doormat. That isn't being a peacemaker. Appeasement is surrendering to people who may abuse you, verbally assault you, and even demean you. You do not try to make peace at any price. Appeasement, therefore, is not the answer. And it does, it, appeasement is not what Jesus is talking about when he said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. So here is the question. Why did Jesus tell us that being a peacemaker is one of the eight keys to happiness? Every beatitude unlocks the door of happiness to your life. I promise you, church, the way to a happy, fulfilled life is to follow the Beatitudes. They are profoundly simple, but profoundly difficult to master in your life. So as we look at the uh, Beatitudes, there are three important reasons why you need to become a peacemaker. Three reasons why everyone needs to be a peacemaker minister of reconciliation. So let's look at firstly, number one, you need to be a peacemaker because you cannot have fellowship with God and live in unresolved conflicts. You cannot be wrong with other people and be right with God. Think about that. The vertical relationship you enjoy with God meets the horizontal relationship you have with other people. And the intersection between the vertical and the horizontal is very important in your life. Because your vertical relationship with God is dependent on how you're doing in the horizontal level 
of your relationships here on earth. Now, people forget that, but that's the truth. Now, you will find people both in the church, outside of the church, who have lived with conflict all their lives. It's become just a way of life. They assume that that's just the way that it's going to be. And this is the way that, for better or for worse, it's my lot in life. To be crosswise with all kinds of people. And so they assume that this is going to be the way that life is going to be. Well, the reason that takes place, church, is because we've never learned the skill of how to be a peacemaker. And so these people have just assumed a life of living in conflict, misery, and unhappiness is just the way you have to live. But that's not true. Now, I'm going to read a verse out of 1 John 5, verse 20. And this verse will challenge you right down your shoelaces. So I'm going to read from 1 John 4, verse 20. And the Bible says, if a man say, I love God, someone says, I love God, but hates his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how... Can he love God whom he hath not seen? So we could ask ourselves this question. Can you love God whom you have not seen when you hate a brother or a sister whom you have seen? That is a hard question. You've got to answer it. Secondly, the reason we need to become a peacemaker is because our prayers are blocked when we are in conflict with other people in unresolved turmoil. When we are at odds with all kinds of people around us, when we are in the midst of conflict, you can kneel down and, and, and you can pray, but if you're part of that problem, God's not going to hear your prayer. He may, he may listen to it, but he's not going to be very favorable toward you. Unresolved conflict in your in your life puts a cloud between you and God. I'm going to read another verse. It's quite challenging. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. It's directed to men. Here's what it says. 1 Peter 3, verse 7. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them. Who do you think them would be referenced? Wives. The wives. Dwell with your wife according to knowledge, giving honor unto the uh, unto the wife as, as under honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Now many see immediately that husbands can block their prayer life through being crosswise with your wife. Now, of course, the reverse is true, and the reverse is true for all of us. Conflict will obscure your relationship with God. It will just make your prayers empty of real spiritual life. So we have to be careful about unresolved conflict if we want to have a good prayer life. Now, there's a third reason why we need to become a peacemaker. The third one is that when we fail to be a peacemaker, we are robbing ourselves from happiness and from the contentment that comes from living a life without conflict. Now, if you could say this morning that you have a life that's in total harmony with all the people in your family, all the people in your church, and even in your workplace, you can count yourselves in fortune indeed. Because there are there's a world of people that cannot say that. And so your happiness is keyed to to a life that is not is without major conflict. When you can when you can lie down and put your head in your pillow at night and know that there's no one 
that's not to, to try to really get you in your family or your church or in the workplace you're in pretty good shape. Now, I've already said it once, but I want to set it, say it again for emphasis. Church, there are there are people in this land who would destroy you in a minute and behead you because they hate Jesus Christ and Christianity. And we're not talking about being at peace with those people. That those are the enemies that will be the enemies forever and ever. But we're talking about people that we live with, people that we go to church with, people that we associate with in families and so forth. So we're looking at how we can uh, become happy. Now, how many of you know this? If you are in conflict in your marriage, do you know that you can go on an exotic vacation? You can go to the Bahamas, and if you're if the wife and husband are hardly talking to each other, it's going to be a miserable vacation. How many agree? At least one or two people. You're not going to be happy. You're not going to be happy, church. You can spend all kinds of money on exotic vacations, and you can buy everything in uh, Sears catalog. Excuse me, on on online. I got a transition. You can buy everything that comes to your mind on Amazon. You're, that doesn't give you happiness. If you've got conflict in your life. You are going to rob yourself of happiness. So you need to say amen whether you want to or not. Amen. Now, I want to read to you from the words of the first bishop of the Church of Jerusalem. That guy is a very important guy. He wrote a book in the Bible. His name is James. And this is what James said about conflict.